Krishna, everybody. This is the translation for the Jai Radha Madhava Kirtan, so bhajan, which we sing before we uh, start the lecture. Would anybody? Would anybody, Shiva Prabhu, would you like to read the translation? Krishna is the lover of Radha. He displays many amorous pastimes in the groves of Vrindavana. He is the lover of the cowherd maidens of Raja and the holder of the great hill named Govardhana. He is the beloved son of Mother Yashoda, the delighter of the inhabitants of Raja. And he wanders in the forest along the banks of the river Yamuna. Jai Radha Madhava Kunj Vihari Gopi Janna
Hare Krishna, everyone. Krishna. Thank you for coming here on this kind of windy Sunday evening. Nice to see all of you for the Sunday feast. And thank you, Rantulji Prabhu, for giving me this opportunity to speak on a very, very tough verse, which is 7.7. I'm going to try my best to try and elucidate that for you. So, like the protocol, I'll say this thrice and then each someone from the congregation say it, right? Okay. Bhagavad Gita 7.7, translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. Matta Parataram Nanyat Matta Parataram Nanyat Kinchi Dasti Dhananjaya Kinchi Dasti Dhananjaya Mai Sarvam Idam Protam Mai Sarvam Idam Protam Sutre Mani Ganaiva Sutre Mani Ganaiva Matta Parataram Nanyat Matta Parataram Kinche das the Dhananjaya Kinche das the Dhananjaya Mai Sarvam Vidam Protam Mai Sarvam Vidam Protam Sutre Mani Ganaiva Sutre Mani Ganaiva Matta Parataram Nanyat Matta Parataram Nanyat Kinche das the Dhananjaya Kinche das the Dhananjaya Mai Sarvam Vidam Protam Mai Sarvam Vidam Protam Sutre Mani Ganaiva explain this verse a little bit. So when I was doing this verse, obviously I was like, oh my goodness, it's such an important verse. And then I realized last time when I gave the class, I thought the same. I said, oh my God, it's such an important verse. <laughs> so basically, you know, when we used to go book distributing or when we do go, we always tell everyone, the Bhagavad Gita is such a magical book. Open the page to any verse and whatever you have gone through that day, or whatever you've been contemplating on that day, somehow the Bhagavad Gita ends up speaking to you exactly in that language. It's such a magical book. So, but this is a, a pretty important verse, and I'll tell you why. Okay, so here's the purport. It's very tiny. It's not the full purport, but I'll just read it, half of it. 
There is a common controversy over whether the supreme absolute truth is personal or impersonal. As far as the Bhagavad Gita is concerned, the absolute truth is the personality of Godhead, Shri Krishna, and this is confirmed at every step. In this verse in particular, it is stressed that the absolute truth is a person. That the personality of Godhead is the supreme absolute truth is also the affirmation of the Brahma Samhita, Ishvara Parma Krishna Satchit Ananda Vigraha, that is, the Supreme Absolute Truth, Personality of Godhead, is Lord Krishna, who is the primeval Lord, the reservoir of all pleasure, Govinda, and the eternal form of complete bliss and knowledge. These authorities leave no doubt that the Absolute Truth is the Supreme Person, the cause of all causes. Right? So basically, this, this verse and this purport tells us this is it. Krishna it is. Everyone has to believe that Krishna is God. Not only is Krishna God, but Krishna is the most supreme Godhead. There is nothing beyond him. There is nothing above him. There is a, everything else is below him. This is the purport. Now, how do you think everyone is going to digest this purport? All of us are devotees over here. Obviously, we've given up our Sunday evenings to come here, though. So there's something about Krishna that is attracting us here. Maybe just the prasada. Maybe that is Krishna's prasada. Maybe that is attracting us. But the fact of the matter is that we're here on a Sunday. So for us, we kind of digest it. Yeah. But how many people are here for the first time? I saw at least six or eight hands go up, right? My family is visiting from Germany. Who, you know, come once every three years to a Hare Krishna temple. Do you think they're going to like the idea when we tell them, Krishna is it, this is it, he is the supreme? I don't think so. And also, Prabhupada didn't want us to be blind followers. He wanted us to question, right? In a humble way, but he wanted us to ask questions. For instance, if someone, like let's say, I don't want to use names because there are so many of them, one school of something comes up and they say, I sat on this rock, on the Himalayas, and I reached, I achieved nirvana, and now I have self-realization, and as per my perspective, this is God. And then, of course, that person gets tens of thousands of followers, and they all say, okay, now this new person is God. Now, we, because, let's say we're not even devotees of Krishna, in general, logical situation, we would question that. Where you sat on that particular rock? Is that rock magical? Or is the fact that you sat on it with only eating khichdi or did you only eat salads? What was it that allowed you to achieve nirvana just by sitting over there and now you declare that this person is God? We would question that, right? I hope we would. Instead of just following that person and donating and then, you know, and doing stuff like that. Prabhupada wants us to do the same. But for us, in the Bhagavad Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is called as it is. And Prabhupada wants to declare what Krishna is saying. Krishna is saying, I'm the supreme. And that is what Prabhupada is telling us. But he's translating it for us. He's elucidating it for us so that we understand it. And many, many advanced speeches. There are so many lectures on 7.7 .7 because as you can see, it's a very, very important verse. This can lead to a lot of controversies, a lot of arguments. And a lot of people may get put off by this and say, Are, kya hai yaar, I'm coming over here just to make friends and you know to chat with you and to do kirtan and you're uh, demanding or you are insisting that Krishna is the supreme. There's so many other gods in the world. Christianity is just the largest. They have the largest number of followers, which of course is being taken over by Islam right now. How dare you sitting in this little Bergen County with 60 people claim that Krishna is the supreme, right? So it can lead to a lot of controversies. But because we had a genius like Prabhupada who explained it to us, and we have so many advanced devotees who have explained it so nicely to us, we can have this discussion right now. It's never anything... Even Krishna at the end of Bhagavad Gita says, now I have explained everything to you. You decide. That is what Krishna consciousness is all about. That is what ISKCON is all about. They want to open it up to us to use our intelligence and make a decision. And to be able to use our intelligence, we have to elucidate everything that Srila Prabhupada is explaining, which is what I am going to attempt to do today. I hope I can convince you folks that Krishna is the supreme. Okay? So, so here's the other thing, right? For all of us who have read the Bhagavad Gita, all of us who have heard lectures and stuff like that, throughout, we know chapters 1 to 6 is all about Karma Yoga. Chapter 7 to 12 is 
Bhakti Yoga. And after that? Jnana Yoga. Jnana Yoga. 13 to 18. Split up beautifully like that. So right now, if I'm on 7.7, .7, that means we've heard lectures up until uh, this, we finished Karma Yoga, the Karma Yoga chapters, the first six chapters. And through those first six chapters, all that Krishna is talking about is detachment. Right? All he's saying is detach, detach, detach. And I'm going to just pick up a select few verses. Here he's saying, 2.58, one who is able to withdraw his senses from sense object as a tortoise draws its limbs within the shell, is firmly fixed in perfect consciousness. Which is what he's trying to say is that so many things surrounding us, sense objects, and our senses get attracted to that. So in 2.58, of course this is slightly taken out of, he talks about the, the nature of a devotee, and he's saying that if within that context you're sitting in, in this environment which is so tempting, Things that smell so fantastic, food, the smell of aroma wafting around your neck. It, despite all that, if you're able to control your senses and bring it under your shell like a tortoise does, then you're a self-realized soul. So he's talking about detachment. Don't be attached to wanting to taste different kinds of foods or your eyes wanting to see this and that. He's teaching us detachment, right? And then in chapter 3 he says, O oh, son of Prita, there is no work prescribed for me within all the planetary systems, nor am I in want of anything, nor have I a need to obtain anything, and yet I am engaged in prescribed duties. So chapter 3, which is about Karma Yoga, he says, everybody should work. Because Arjuna asked him at the beginning of the chapter, should I work? You confuse me now at the end of chapter 2, should I be working or should I go and meditating? So Krishna says, everyone needs to work. Everyone. A homemaker works the hardest. A homemaker is working. Any kind of a job, you need to work because you need to sustain yourself. So you must work. And Krishna is saying, I'm working myself. Right? Because if I didn't work, then everybody would follow what I did. Vacationing and just stealing butter and doing all that stuff. So he's saying everyone needs to work. And again, he, what does he insist after that? Work, but don't get attached to the results of your work. Right? A lot of people... Again, when we're distributing Bhagavad Gita, they'll say, how, how, man, I read Bhagavad Gita. So they'll say, Acha, what do you, what's your, what's your gist, what's your take on the Bhagavad Gita? They'll say, ah, Krishna says, do whatever you want, but don't get attached. So that's their, you know, some all of, of the Bhagavad Gita, which is fine, but they have that. So Krishna says here, everybody must work, everybody. Don't just think, living in Kali Yuga, we are not qualified to go and sit in the forest and meditate. We are not qualified to do any of that. Sannyasis in our movement, yes. But all of us over here, we need to be careful about just deciding to give up everything and going to meditate. Right? Then, so again, that was detachment. Then in 4.20, he says, abandoning all attachment of results of his activities, ever satisfied and independent, he performs no fruitive action, although engaged in all kinds of undertakings. And I put, this is Urban Monk, Gadadhar Pandit Das. For those of you who have been coming for the you know, past many years, he would actually come here to give us a lecture. Wonderful, wonderful monk. And you can see from Gadadhar Pandit's um, uh, occupation, he preaches. He's got all the uh, Fortune 500 companies where he goes to preach. He goes to Google and he goes here and there. But, and you can still see how he's maintained his uh, austerities. You know, it's not that he's now, now that he's, he's, he's got this consulting gig at Google, it's not that he's, he's driving around in a flashy car or he's doing anything of that sort. He still maintains that humility and he goes to preach at all these five hundred. So again, Krishna is trying to tell us that whatever you do, maintain that austerity. Don't get attached to what you're doing and then don't become flamboyant based on, you know, the fact that, oh, now I'm become a VP and now I'm become this and now, you know, I've got a promotion and, and things like that, okay? Again... What we I'm trying to get across here is detachment. In the first six chapters, Krishna was teaching us detachment. And one last one from this is such a beautiful, beautiful verse. And I love the way we, we can remember these pictures. And that's why I like to put pictures. So if anything, you know, you remember of this whole lecture, you'll say, ah, that lotus leaf with that drop of water. So what Krishna is saying here is that one who performs his duty without attachment, surrendering the results unto the Supreme Lord, is unaffected by sinful action as the lotus leaf is untouched by water. Isn't this such a beautiful thing? 
again he's talking about how we all live in this material world we are all exposed to temptations everywhere he's telling us to be aware of the fact do you are you going to get tempted if you do like to eat rasgullas offer it it's not that you you're supposed to give up rasgullas no make the rasgullas offer it and eat it as a prasadam so you we have to be aware of where we are getting tempted to do nonsense and where we can satisfy krishna within that whole little um boundaries that we've set for ourselves not boundaries that's not the right word i'll find it so here's again detachment and then in chapter 6 he talks about dhyana yoga right this is a beautiful chapter so now he's telling uh, arjuna he's saying to practice yoga one should go to a secluded place and should lay kusa grass on the ground and then cover it with a deer skin and a soft cloth one should hold one's body neck and head erect in a straight line and stare steadily at the tip of the nose as a lamp in a windless place does not waver so the transcendentalist whose mind is controlled remains always steady in his meditation on the transcendent self so the first five were karma this is dhyana yoga dhyana is the yoga of the mind where we are trying to join unite with the lord and dhyana yoga this is what he's saying we should do now why is krishna confusing us with all these things right one would think he's confusing it if you take it out of context but as you go through the bhagavad gita you realize how he's treating us with such um uh, such respect he's basically respecting us you know he's saying you my intelligent child i'm putting all this out there in front of you you decide what you want to do i'm laying it out all there for you and then you decide what you need to do right so in dhyana yoga this is what he's saying If you don't want to do karma yoga, then you do dhyana yoga. This is what you need to do. You need to go to a forest, lay the grass, sit straight, and then you'll be able to achieve me. But of course, in the Bhagavad Gita, we have our best friend forever, BFF, who is Arjuna, who says, Krishna, the mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, and very strong. And to subdue it, I think, is more difficult than controlling the wind. Arjuna is his friend. He's saying, "I'm sorry. What are you? What are you suggesting to me? I'm not going to be able to do any of that. My mind is turbulent, chanchala. The mind is chanchala. It's turbulent like the wind. I'm not going to be able to do any of this. You better try and think of something that's practical, that's applicable to me in the Kali Yuga, right? That's what Arjuna tells him. And then, of course, Krishna ends this the whole Karma Yoga by saying, 'The yogi who situated with me is the best in me, and all that.' That ends." karma yoga chapters 1 to 6 where krishna has been teaching us detachment all this while and guess what he starts with 7.1 immediately he starts with attachment right this is where it starts karma yoga starts from 7 to 12 the first verse itself goes like this shri bhagavan vacha mai yashakta mana partha yogam yunjan mad ashraya asamshayam samagram mam yatha jnana si tat shrunu Okay, knowledge of this. So here he says, now here, and the other one says with mind attached to me. Let's talk about now here. In all this, you know, we've been saying one has to be intelligent, one has to be logical, and one has to do this and that. But you can say, I don't have the time or the inclination to read any of your books. I'm not interested in any of that. But Krishna has made it so easy for us. that even if you are walking by and if someone is chanting even if you come here only for the prasadam and you are stuck to listening to my lecture the fact is that the sound is going in our ears are wide open and that is why the sound is the prime of the the of the five objects right ether air fire water and earth sound was what originated first the word om sound travels through space through ether as we call it the word om came through that so that's why krishna says tat shrunu the nine devotional practices that prahlad maharaj taught us the first one was shravanam shravanam only by hearing when you're doing laundry listen to a lecture when you're cooking listen to a lecture when you're traveling by bus or train listen to a lecture doesn't matter if you're not paying attention the sound vibration goes in and goes to our heart and that little crooked krishna gets stuck in our heart of that such a beautiful beautiful little picture that someone has painted for us just by listening okay and the second one is with mind attached to me so you see 
Six chapters he told us, do your karma yoga, work on money, buy a car, do what you want, buy a house. He's told us to do all that with detachment and now he's saying with attachment to me. Now, just by telling people to be attached to me, right? What's the one thing that you can't buy in this world? Love. You can't buy love, right? However much money you pay, you can't buy love. You have to acquire it. And Krishna also wants that. He wants us to go to him and give him our love unconditionally. So he says, with mind attached to me. Now, so Krishna says, okay, with mind attached to me, come to me. I'm going to give, I've given you the sun and the rain. I've given you this. Like, you know, a lot of people, members in the family can say, I provide for you. I've got your house and I've got your car and this and that. And yet you have no regard for me. But you don't, you can't buy respect, right? You have to command respect. In the same way, love, you can't buy love. So this is what Krishna says, with mind attached to me. And then from this verse onward till the end of, I mean, through the, the whole, all of Bhagavad Gita, he talks about himself, right? He explains what he does and it allows us to then fall in love with him. And that is what the Bhagavad Gita is. The Bhagavad Gita is a book of love. It may be the song of God, it may be this and that, poetic and... But the bottom line is this, the Bhagavad Gita is a book of love. And if we treat it like the book of love, you will fall in love with it and you will fall in love with Krishna. So now coming back to the verse that I'm actually supposed to speak on today, which is supposed to be BG 7.7, .7, it says, O conqueror of wealth, there is no truth superior to me, everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on a thread. Now again, Prabhupada says Krishna is the supreme and equivocally. That's it. This is the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Krishna is the supreme as it is. Right? So Srila Prabhupada says that whatever is manifested, spiritual or material, emanates from one source. Energy and energetic cannot be separated. Both are simultaneously present. So this is, this is from Prabhu, one of Prabhupada's lectures, right? So he says, if, this, if we say that the sun is the supreme energy of the earth, like for instance, we know that if the sun moves a, a few inches away to the left, then the earth can scorch. And if it moves a little to the other side, it can freeze. So there would be no life available on this planet. The sun is a pre precisely positioned where it needs to be so that life on earth can survive. So if we say that the sun is the cause of life, on earth, in the same way Prabhupada says, Krishna is the cause of all the universes, not only just one sun, but all the universes put together. And then he says a very classic statement, everything in the world is Krishna or Krishnas. That's it. Everything in the world is Krishna or Krishnas. Okay. Now again, like I said at the beginning, people will think, oh my goodness, these fanatics are here and stuff like that. But Prabhupada explains it. He has books and books and lectures and letters and he's taken the trouble to explain it all to us, right? So let's talk about the first thing, right? Let's talk about science and Krishna to dispute it, all right? So let's say we have the scientists who want to dispute the fact that Krishna is the supreme. Now, discussions about the relationship between science and religion usually end in statement. They've never found a solution. And actually, that's what keeps them running. It keeps them going like that. My father-in-law, who passed away, who many of you have seen, used to, is a, was a physicist. And he used to write poetry. And he would always attend this science and religion lectures he would attend. Because they had a lot to say. Everyone has a lot to say. Our scientists have a lot to say. The religionists have a lot to say. But the twain shall never meet. They could never find a solution as to which was supreme. But these all conversations go on. Beautiful halls get booked, people travel. So it's, it's a wonderful system that just, you know, just keeps happening, right? But from ISKCON's side, we begin to see that a lot of the scientist community are now looking at ISKCON, are reaching out to ISKCON to validate because they know that we are uh, the preeminent Vedic uh, reservoir. So they are actually looking at us, right? So the NYU and University of California, they have articles on Bhakti Swarup Damodar Maharaj on ISKCON and science. Then of course, all of us know about Sadhputta Das, who was the, uh, you know, he's written all these wonderful, wonderful books. And then Radha Mohan Das, who's currently at the Bhakti Vedanta Manor, he has a beautiful article on the Back to Godhead magazine, if anyone has read that wonderful article, right? So there are all these conversations going. Now what ISKCON does is, 
if a scientist comes to comes to us and says that you know i i don't want to believe in god and they're like okay fine if there's no need for you to believe in god i so so the scope of science and religion is is beyond this class in reality what i'm trying to say is the scope of science and religion is beyond my scope i am not competent enough to talk about it but i can guide you to the place where there are genius scientists in this con and religionists who can have a very very decent conversation with scientists who want to argue about the fact that krishna is not the supreme so it exists so be very comfortable with that okay so when you tell someone krishna is the supreme and they say no prove it to me they say hey www.krishnasupreme.com so there's a lot of content over there don't be afraid of that okay and then again in 7.15 krishna himself says there are four kinds of people who will not be attracted to him so you see how this which cycle will go on the next class of dushkriti is called mayaya parta gyana or those persons whose erudite knowledge has been nullified by the influence of illusory material energy see they are mostly very learned fellows great philosophers poets literati scientists etc but the illusory energy misguides them and therefore they disobey the supreme lord so krishna has already project, predicted this that the scientists because of their vast knowledge they are not going to be attracted to krishna so when we know that you know that basically we're going to have an argument with this person who is a phd triple phd from all these well known colleges we should guide them to the person who can have a decent conversation with them this is pointless for us to have an argument with them okay so that's the first thing the second thing is other religions and krishna right so now like i said there's many people who are visiting here for the first time and there are many people who are not exactly from the hindu religion so they may say how dare you say that how dare you say krishna is the supreme what happens to jesus and what happens to allah and what happens to jehovah and stuff like that right we can say things like that so is so, so this is this is from actually we have a brochure is con communication has a beautiful brochure over there and this is what it says in the brochure in the 1950s shri prabhupad confirmed this approach in an appeal to the leaders of the world's religions he said hindus muslims christians and the members of the other sects that have convincing faith in the authority of god must not sit idly now and silently watch the rapid growth of a godless civilization right what is prabhupad trying to say over here prabhupad is saying follow whichever religion you want you don't need to follow krishna consciousness follow jesus follow allah but follow them don't just come and argue with the hari krishnas and say oh you guys are fanatics and you only believe in krishna my god is greater we agree your god is greater for you go ahead and follow in his footsteps follow what jesus said and follow what allah said and this is exactly what prabhupada said we are again not in the business of getting an argument we are in the business of inviting you to have delicious prasadam we are in the business of allowing you to sit, sing and dance and if you have the tolerance to please sit for a lecture in which we want to show that we are a compassionate group of people right and they're intelligent we want to lay it out all there for you and say now you choose you decide who you want to love okay so this is as far as the other religions and krishna goes and then uh, so this is this whole thing that he gave a beautiful lecture and all that so that is about the other religions now let's come to india we think we have problems only here in america in india itself we have no one wants to believe that krishna is a supreme think about this in tamil nadu they actually have civil wars because they say i want to go horizontal versus i want to go vertical right all of us know that i am a shivai i am a, i am a vaishnava right there is a problem west bengal everyone only wants to believe in durga they must say durga mata ki jai she is the supreme Maharashtra Ganesh festival everything shuts down financial capital of india is just absolutely shuts down because there's ganpatis going to every river and and ocean and north india they say ram mahan hai krishna mahan nahi hai so for indians they have a very clear thing listen you can feel free to believe in who you want but my request is please read the scripture read the shiva purana you'll understand that shiva himself is saying that krishna is the supreme he is a devotee of lord krishna he himself meditates upon krishna when you learn when you read about durga mata you will know she is maya maya devi she is a very very powerful administrator of lord shri krishna 
We have to give her respects. We have to pray to her. But she herself will tell you she's not the supreme. Lord Ganesha will tell you he's not the supreme. And Lord Ram will also tell you that he came in the Treta Yuga. He's a form of Krishna, but Krishna is the supreme. Right? So again, in India itself, when we have all these disputes as to who is, who is greater than the other person, we again invite them to come for lectures. And we tell them, if you don't want to come for our lectures, read your own God's lecture. Like read the Shiva Purana and you'll understand that Shiva himself is saying that he is the greatest devotee of the Lord. And then, of course, we have all these other gods, right? We have, we had a discussion. Someone was talking about Paramahamsa. Paramahamsa, who first came to America in the 1930s, and he says, Yata mat tathapat. Okay? Religion does not mean I have manufactured some religion. He has manufactured some religion. He has manu and another man. Yes, all religions are right. This is what Paramahamsa said. Whatever path you choose is fine because all paths will lead to one. And Prabhupada says that is absolute nonsense. One lecture I heard, one Swamiji was saying this person should be slapped for saying rubbish like that. They don't do things like that. It doesn't lead like that. You're misleading people. You're misguiding people. Don't do that. You know? So this is another form of people who, who misguide by... Again, this, was a, this is a situation of... Now, these are mystic yogis. They have performed austerities, no doubt about it. But when they make claims like this, we should be intelligent enough to question it and say, any path I choose will lead me to God? You have to think about that, right? So this is Paramahamsa. And of course, we have our famous gods of these days. We have, my family loves John Lennon, so, but you know, he thought he was God. So I believe in me and Yoko. That's it. So he was God, his wife was God, and they wanted to pray to themselves, and they thought everybody else was God. And this beautiful, beautiful song that he has, Imagine, he's, he's got a song over there where he felt that, you know, the worship of false idols, he felt that organized religion did more harm than good. According to his Imagine song, he said that there would be a better world where there was no religion. And here are the others. There's actually a celebrity worship syndrome now. There's so much stuff on this. He said, why do people have this obsessive, addictive disorder Right. So there's the celebrities become God for them. You have a Justin Bieber God. And you have a, a, a Miley Cyrus God. They are, they're all gods and we pray to them. And there's a syndrome and there's a whole psychology article and books written about uh, behavior where you start worshipping a celebrity. Okay, maybe this is kind of come, has, has boiled up now because of, of social media and the fact that, you know, they're all exposed so much. But this is actually uh, an obsessive order right now where... Celebrities have become God, right? So, we've spoken about four people who could dispute the fact that Krishna was God. And we've kind of given them subtle answers as to why they can't be God. You can't have Justin Bieber be a God because Justin Bieber is not God. He's going to fall down and he's going to eventually die. But he's going to fall down, you know. That's, that's what it is. He's going to get old. He's going to age. He's going to fall sick. And then he's going to pass away. So he can't be God, right? And then we've spoken about, so any questions up until now as to how we could, um, in a gentle manner, dispute these four divisions of people who claim Krishna is not God. Okay. So now what happens is the Vedic conclusion. The Vedic conclusion, 1.1.1, Srimad Bhagavata. Athato Brahma Dishnyasya. Now is the time to inquire about the absolute truth. My children used to have a t-shirt which I used to absolutely love. Black t-shirt, one single line. Human life is meant for self-realization. They wore it for the longest time till everything started outgrowing and hanging or whatever. Human life is meant for, meant for self-realization. Beautiful, beautiful t-shirt. Okay? And of course, we all know in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.1.1, Guru Chana Prabhu has a very nice lecture on 1.1.1. He said when Prabhupada started writing the Srimad Bhagavatam, he was already pretty aged, right? He didn't even think he was going to complete 18,000 verses. So at that point, he decided that Canto 1, he was going to put all his energies into Canto 1. And then as he was aging and, you know, bones were creaking, and he said, I'm going to put all my energies into Chapter 1 of Canto 1. And then what he actually did was he put all his energy into Verse 1, Chapter 1, Canto 1 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So Gurijana Prabhu has such a nice lecture on 1.1 as to what the thought processes that Prabhupada had when he was doing 1.1.1 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay? So the Vedic conclusion is that the human form of life is especially meant for this purpose and therefore the, it's for inquiring. The human form of life is meant for inquiring, question. We've seen the Bhagavad Gita starts with Arjuna asking Krishna questions. The Srimad Bhagavatam is where Parikshit Maharaj questions. In a very humble way you question, right? This is, it's a question and answer thing. You have doubts, there are advanced people who will have answers to your question. That's the beauty of uh, our dharma, the, the uh, Sanatan dharma. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, show you some other slides as to some other verses everywhere, all over the place, where in, uh, uh, again, SB 1.1.1, Srila Prabhupada says, everything that exists emanates from the Lord. That's it. Period. In chapter 9, verse 4, again, which is a part of Bhakti Yoga, Krishna says, by me, in my unmanifested form, this entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. Okay? So we see throughout the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna keeps saying that he is God, he is God, he is God. Now I ask you, I have not read the other scriptures. I've not read Christianity or Judaism, but I doubt very much that they have the person who's speaking who says, I'm God. I don't think Jesus says I'm God. Jesus has, kept, has always said that I'm the son of God, right? So we have this picture of God sitting there and Jesus sitting by his side and we are passing judgment or whatever. He's a very loving God. Prabhupada had very, very high regard for, for the Christians and for Jesus and stuff like that. He was a very pure devotee. Right? But none of those scriptures say, I am God. But here Krishna blatantly, I am God. Many verses you will see. Okay? And look, like, look at this one. Right? All beings are in me, but I am not in them. And then again, 9.22. But those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. Right? And then 10.8. These are the Chatur Shlokis of the Bhagavad Gita. I am the source of all spiritual and material world. Everything emanates from me. What other language should this be translated into? Everything emanates from me. This, the wise who perfectly know this, engage in my devotional service and worship me with their hearts. Look at that word. They worship me with their hearts. They worship me because they love me. Of course, we know when we come to Krishna consciousness, we don't come because we love Krishna. Many do, but many don't, right? Like again, in chapter 7, as we keep going down, you know, as you'll be hearing lectures, four, kind of people, four kinds of people come to worship Krishna. People who want money, people who are in distress, people who are curious, and people who actually want to know about Krishna, right? So this is what he says. When we get into the whole practice, that's when we even get a slight iota of what loving Krishna is all about. And then again in 10.20, I am the super soul of Arjuna seated in the hearts of all living entities. I am the beginning, the middle and the end of all beings. Okay? And then 10.41, know that all opulent, beautiful and glorious creations spring but from a spark of my splendor. So, after reading all this, we come to the conclusion that Krishna underlies, outlies, overlies and outlies, right? So in this verse 7.7, .7, we see that he's holding all the universes together by being that thread, that invisible thread that is holding the pearl necklace together. He's invisible. So he's underlying all that. And then in verse um, 9.10, he's overlying the world. That means he's above the material manifestation. So scientific discoveries show the magnificent order that permeates the universe. There's so many things that are indescribable, right? The universe is floating in air. Firstly, there was a big drama when Galileo came up with the fact that the universe was round and going around, uh, around the sun. There are a million other things that we've not even discovered. But they're happening. The sun is exactly there so it doesn't burn us. You, balls are just floating in the air. It's happening. So scientists, as much as they try to 
explain these kind of phenomena, we still agree that it's something that has, they don't have a conclusive answer to. Okay? So that is where Krishna is overlying these universes. And the last one is Krishna outlies this world. This is so beautiful because Krishna explains that he's not in this material world. He has his own spiritual world, Goloka Vrindavan. If all that he had to do was take care of us, listen to us crying and complaining and, you know, demanding our stuff, he wouldn't be a happy God. But Krishna is a happy God. He's a smiling God. He's up there in Goloka Vrindavan. He's got his own pastimes going on, happening all the time. So Krishna underlies, he overlies, and he outlies. This is these three, this sentence is from Chaitanya, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu's lecture. Beautifully explained. Right? This is basically everywhere, but he specifies it for us. He's inside the pearl necklace. He's outside managing everything that's just happening. We just think that a small seed which is thrown in the ground becomes a huge oak tree. Someone has taken care of that, right? Someone has managed that. He outlies and then uh, he overlies and then he outlies. After doing all this, he still is doing his pastimes in Guloka Vrindavan. Now, after giving you folks all this big lecture on logic and intelligence and you know making sense and uh, how not to have an argument with anybody else, the bottom line of this whole thing, what's the bottom line of this whole thing? The taste of the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? And what do we do? We just go and ask people, chant and be happy. Because that's all, it's in the holy name. Krishna doesn't eat, fine. If we want to get into the argument of Krishna as a supreme, we have scientific books and, you know, we have a lot of documentation and, and, and speeches like that. But for the simplest, the simplest way to appreciate Krishna is by practicing the chanting. And how do you, how do, you do that? By developing a relationship with them. Let's say you don't want to chant. Okay, you have a and how do you start the process? You start the process by saying... Hey Prabhu, let me set the tables today. Hey Prabhu, let me clean up today. And then let me make rice today. Let me do book distribution today. Simple things, just with that spark, love develops. The Bhagavad Gita, like I said before, is a book of love. And we should only remember that Krishna loves us so much that he tries to give us this, and karma yoga, and jnana yoga, and bhakti. He gives us everything. But all he wants is our love. If he Blindly give him love and we, he doesn't care about us trying to understand the concepts of what the Bhagavad Gita is. That's the beauty of uh, Krishna consciousness. It's all about love. And here you can have, uh, you know, of course, you can have uh, the Shantaras. These are the five rasas, right? The five relationships that we can have. Shantaras, where you say, okay, I believe Krishna is God. I'll come to the temple one Sunday and, you know, do my stuff and go back. Shanta. Right. And then you have Dasiras where you hold Krishna in awe and you say, now I want to serve you, Krishna. And you can do many things to serve him, right? That's your relationship with him. But you look at him in awe and reverence. You go to the temple and then you've done the vats and you sit in the corner and, and that, that, that is relationship. And then you have, um, who is this? Sakyas. Sakyas is where you're his friend, right? Who's the best example that we have of the friendship? Arjuna. Arjuna. Beautiful, beautiful example, right? They used to share the same bed, they used to tumble around and stuff like that. You can have, you can be Krishna's friend. The conversations that you have with Krishna, each and every one of us, each and every, we just think there's seven billion, no. It's in all the universes. Each and every one of us has a very, very distinct relationship with Krishna, right? And that is a relationship that we can develop with Krishna by talking to him and by serving him. And then, of course, you have Vatsalya Ras. We'll be talking a lot about Vatsalya Ras in the coming weeks when uh, Kartik month starts. You can treat Krishna as your son. Right? What a wonderful child to have. Think about that. That's a relationship that you can have. And you can say, oh, Krishna, I want to feed you butter today. Oh, Krishna, I want to make this for you. That's a relationship you can have. And, of course, the highest rasa is the Madhurya Rasa. We can develop that too. But Prabhupada says that the gopis of Vrindavan have that rasa, the Madhurya Rasa. Okay? Now, how do we develop this? 
we can sit here for lectures, we can do so many hundred things, but Krishna has made it so easy for us, Prabhupada has made it so easy for us, he says, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Chant Hare Krishna. And I have to end this with, with uh, a really, really lovely, lovely story. So what happened is, uh, this is John and Mary Kennedy, right? My Prabhu and I, we went to Pennsylvania to see this lady, Mary Kennedy. They're not from the Kennedy family, but their names are also Kennedy. She's, uh, her, her cancer came back, so she's, um, she has to go back for chemo and stuff like that. So we said, let's go and visit them because we've known them from before. Now they are in their uh, late 60s, they're almost 70 years old, right? So we went and we spent some time with them and I gave her a little gift. I, I had a cloth bag that said, Chant Hare, Chant Hare Krishna and be happy. So she was so happy with all that and then it was a cloth bag. So she, she gave me the bag back. I said, no, 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 that's for you. She saw that and she said, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Okay, so she remembers this, right? And then the strange part is that we said, oh, we have to leave early Sunday morning because uh, I have to give a lecture. And they said, oh, so he says, so explain to me, right? So we were sitting and we were just talking and guess what he does? He runs to his bedroom and he brings a Bhagavad Gita. But he brings a Bhagavad Gita from the 70s. Beautiful brown leather. It has a leather cover with gold embossed on it. He's been carrying that book with him since the 1970s. Beautiful. I, I told him, I said, John, please keep this. This is gold for you right now, you know, because these books don't exist anymore. Pristinely, he's kept it and he reads through that whole thing. Right? He reads that whole thing. And then he was saying, yeah, I know the Hare Krishna. So we were like, how do you know the Hare Krishnas? And he said that in the 70s, when he used to go to court authority to pick up his wife, he said, oh, the Hare Krishnas would be standing there and they would be jumping and they would be dancing. And he's a runner. So that's why my Prabhuji and me get along, they, they are very much in contact because he's a runner. At 69 years old, I think he's done about 11 or 16 marathons or whatever he says, every time I go on a race, I chant this mantra. Can you believe that? I'm like, really, you chant this mantra? So then we said, what do you chant? So I wrote it down for him and he said it, he said it together. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. He's telling us that I chant this mantra. I said, do you know what it means? He's like, no, it just soothes me. I chant it. When Mary goes for her chemo at the Hackensack Hospital, I chant this mantra. So can you imagine the power of the mantra? Some devotees were jumping up and down in court authority. This gentleman heard it 40, 50 years ago. He's carried that mantra with him. He's carried that book with him. And it's close to his heart. So this is the power of the Hare Krishna mantra. And this is what Krishna wants from us. All he wants is love. All this, these slides that I put up on, you know, religion and uh, and all that stuff is great. It exists. It's backup material for you guys. When people say, oh, you fanatics, you say, no, 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 no I'm sorry. I just saw 16 slides that Arundhati Mataji put up. I know we are great people. We have a lot of backup, uh, uh, backup data to, to back up. But... All that is not necessary. The Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, this beautiful distribution of prasadam, all that will take us a very, very long way in uh, Krishna consciousness and allowing us to advance in an advanced devotees. Instead of chanting 16, they chant 32 rounds. It's all in the chanting, in the holy name, which so kindly Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us for Kali Yuga. That's all we need to do. Chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So Hare Krishna, that was my little spiel. Questions? Yes, Prabhuji, and I was afraid of you. I think you have your answer for your own question. <laughs> well, you, you see, the problem is usually I, I want to ask you questions so I can find fault with the speaker and show how I'm better. If you're, I can find any fault with you. Oh, Hare Paul. If, if I can, I have, a, 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 I have three comments and then a question. So my first comment is that uh, I, I think we have to be a little bit cautious. You described these different uh, rasas you can have with Krishna. Um, because uh, we don't want to have to say, uh, take a Sahajya point of view and think, oh yes, I'm Krishna's the mother. Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur in the Chaitanya Shikshamrita makes a very interesting point. He says that we first have to develop a relationship of Dasya with Lord Chaitanya. And when that relationship becomes complete, the door opens for our realization of what our relationship with Krishna is. So that's 
So hold on, Prabhu. I want to reiterate that's a very, very important point. So with the slide that I showed where we could have five points, what Prabhuji said was very important. But even what Thakur said, that we should first develop a Dasya relationship with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's very important. And then the doors open up. Thank you, Prabhu, for that. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, somehow by Krishna's arrangement, uh, over the last several months, I've had opportunities to engage in discussions with people who are really into their practice of Christianity, even with a uh, Catholic priest. And what I've done is, very, I, say, I say to them, the Vedas make it very simple. That personality that is the source of everything, the cause of everything, has no cause himself, that is God. Every theistic tradition can accept that definition. And then I simply say, just like, you know, I may have so many different names. I'm initiated in Norway. My name is, my parents name named Mike. Somebody when I was teaching called me Mr. Major. So God also has many names. Allah, Jehovah, we have no problem. Krishna just means all attractive. And I found that these people were very comfortable with accepting that. There wasn't a question of, oh, my Krishna, you're Allah. No, no, they would accept that. So if anybody wants to follow that line. And the, and the uh, third point, I, there's a, in dealing with scientists, and I'm certainly not a scientist, but Prabhupada used to say, bring on the scientists. I'm not a scientist, he would say, but bring them on. So there's a precursor qu uh, point that has to be brought up in the discussion with some scientists, and that is the question of epistemology. Okay, you, you say to me, prove, prove that there's God, fine. Let's first decide what constitutes proof, because we'll find that in science, no scientist redoes every experiment. They simply accept that their teacher tells them, yeah, water's made out of a hydrogen and oxygen. They haven't done. So therefore, the real thing is question of faith. That's the real thing. Okay, now my question. <laughs> okay. I was so happy you were just going to make statements. <laughs> Everybody's still awake. I thought I'd put it by the seat. <laughs> um, you made a, a, a point that Prophet actually writes in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, no blind following. We have to use our logic and our intelligence. So here's my question. Our intelligence is a material intelligence. Bhakti Siddhanta makes it very clear, logic and intelligence have no access to the transcendental realm. So then my question is, how can we use our material intelligence, material logic, to help to understand that Krishna's God? Thank you. Actually, that's thank you for that question because it makes me think. So please forgive me, Prabhu. I'm trying to attempt to answer this question. So when I made that statement, I was basically, and I'm sorry to use those words right now, although I don't want to call them out. There are many little Indian groups. Like for instance, there is a particular sadhu who's going around motorbikes and he's become very popular and stuff like that. And um, there, is, there is another group doing some other stuff. So when I was saying we need to use our logic and intelligence, the thing would be, you're seeing this person who's going around doing something. So question, ask some basic common sense questions as to, you know, do you just want to follow this person? What, what substantiates him being a guru, so say, you know, those kind of things. But to your point, um, does intelligence and logic take us to um, the spiritual world? Maybe not, but it's also the first stepping stone because it, in, in my case, so what happened was um, a lot of people know that we stumbled into a, a Hare Krishna temple. I just wanted to teach my children Hindi and I'm like, oh, good, this temple should have some Hindi classes. So we came and um, you know, the kids are obviously too late, they don't know Hindi, but <laughs> they started going to Sunday school. And um, I sat there for the lecture, and then the first lecture I heard was, so which made logical sense to me, is that whoever that sannyasi was who was talking, he said, when we are in India, we have to drive on this side of the road, on the left side. And when we come to America, we have to drive on the right side. And we don't question it, like sheep. We agree, because we know if we don't, then the cops are going to come us and, and give us tickets. So when you do that, why don't you use your intelligence just, just thinking a little ahead and assuming that who is giving me the sunlight, who is giving me water, who is giving me all these beautiful things in this life. There has to be someone who is doing that for me and he's doing it free of charge. 
The best things in life are free, right? We know that. So that little bit of intelligence, which made logic to me, ah, what am I, an idiot? I don't even like the president or prime minister of India, and still I have to listen to what he's saying, that kind of a thing, you know? So it doesn't take us to the spiritual world, but it allows us to step deeper into something that is appealing to us. I hope that answered your question. You can answer it yourself, actually. Right? <laughs> yeah. actually said that we, we have to have the logic to be able to answer arguments when they come up. So your point is very